up to this point, Paul has been focusing on our defensive armor. But now he comes to the one offensive weapon called the sword of the spirit. Please note, it's the spirit sword. It is the resource that he uses to address the spiritual attacks that you're facing. There are two Greek words for sword. One has to do with the long sword, where you're fighting the enemy from somewhat of a distance. But the Greek word used here is the word for dagger. It's that short sword for up close in your face battle. This is when the enemy has come right at you. This is when he's digging at you and there's no escape because he has encompassed you. And you must get to him quickly and definitively and decisively. This is the sword that Jesus used in the wilderness when he was under the attack against the devil. It is the sword that the spirit uses for you to stab the enemy and bring a death blow to his attempts to defeat you when he has come against you with full force. Let's learn about this sword and how you can stab the enemy and experience spiritual victory. verse 17 and gives the last piece of the armor but he gives you the last piece right now in verse 17 he says and take the sword of the spirit which is the word of God remember the verb take means pick up as needed the last three of the armors use that verb. The first three uses the verb to be. That is, this is the state you should always be in. But these last three deals with the verb to take. Pick up as needed or as appropriate. He says, I want you to pick up the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. This is very important because this is the only offensive piece of weapon in the arsenal. Everything else is designed to hold you steady from what the enemy is seeking to do in the evil day. But now in this last one, he has put a weapon in your hand. The soldier has two types of swords in the Roman army. The long sword, the, the sword that allows you to fight at a distance because it is extended. But the Greek word for sword here is not the word for the long sword like the swashbuckling kind of sword that you would see in movies and on television. The Greek word sword here is the word dagger. It was approximately an, an 18 inch dagger. The dagger was used for up close fighting, in your face fighting. The dagger was used when you were in hand to hand combat and your enemy was right up close. So the word for sword here, the Greek word for sword, is the word for dagger. And the dagger was needle sharp. It was used for giving a death blow because the enemy is up on you. Have, has the, has the enemy ever been up on you, on you, on you? See, in a general way, we know the devil and his emissaries are like always there. 
but sometime they're up in your grill. They have confronted you and it is your evil day. Because he's talking about this is the evil day. This is, uh, you're under attack. The attack is, is, is creating consternation and conflict and chaos. It's like somebody getting up in your face. Well, the dagger was for that kind of battle. He says, I'm going to give you the sword for the up close in your face battle. He says it is the sword of the spirit. He says the sword of the spirit. It is the tool that the spirit uses. But here's the most important thing. It is the only tool he uses. It is the spirit's offensive weapon. It is the tool he uses in the spiritual realm. It is the tool he uses to address what's happening in the invisible world for what's in your face in the visible world. He says, it is the sword of the spirit. It is what the spirit uses to deal with what is causing you consternation in the world in which you live that comes from the invisible world that you do not see. Now, if you don't believe it's coming from the invisible world, you won't use this sword. You'll do like Moses and Peter. When Moses tried to deliver Israel, he killed the Egyptian. Peter wanted to deliver Jesus, he cut off the servant's ear. He pulled out his sword and he sliced the servant's ear off in order to protect Jesus. Jesus had to, God in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament, had to instruct both of them, I don't need that. I, I, I don't need your human methodology, human approach, human perspective, human orientation to fight a spiritual battle. One of the reasons why so many of us so often are losing our battles is we go to human. And once you go to human, that's not a sword the spirit uses. He doesn't use that. He doesn't use that sword. When you choose to use a man-made method for a spiritually derived cause, you have no support from God in your fight. That's why the Bible says that the wrath of man does not accomplish the purposes of God. In other words, your human anger, that's why the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will replay. I've got my own approach and your method is not my method. My ways are not your ways. I don't handle it like you handle it. In the spiritual realm, the only tool that the Spirit of God uses is this dagger. And it is needle sharp. It is because we have not believed in the power of the dagger. And we know we don't believe it because we don't use it. That we don't see the enemy being sliced and diced. He says, this sword, this sword is what the Spirit of God will use in your battle, conflict, evil day. And it is the only one in the arsenal. Maybe it's the only one you have because it's the only one you need. What 
what is this sword? He says, which is the word of God. Which is the word of God. So he tells you that the spirit has a sword that he has given to us to use in the battle. The spirit, because it's a sword that belongs to the spirit, it's just put in your hand to use. And he says, this sword is the word of God. Now, let me give you three words for the word of God so that you can understand how this works. Because we want you to use the sword correctly. Graphe, Logos, and Ramus. Rhema. Graphe. That is the Greek word for the writings. Graphe means the writings. Scripture is called in the Bible graphe, the writings. That's the book, the, the book. This is, this is the word of God, but it's the word of God graphe. In other words, as I sit it down there on the podium, as you hold the book in your hand, you are holding graphe. You're holding 66 books and the words that make them up, that compose the canon of scripture. Whether you have it on your shelf at home, whether you have it on your coffee table, whether you have a, want a copy in your car, whether it was tucked under your arms when you walked in the church, you came in with graphe. You came in with the book. You came in with the word of God in written form. He says, God gives the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, but the Greek word is not graphe. This is graphe. This is, this is the written book, and it is the Bible. But when he talks about the spirit's use, he's not talking about you walking around with a Bible in your hand or having a Bible in your car. Because, see, some people use the Bible as a graphe like a rabbit's foot. You see folk got crosses dangling from their rearview mirror like that's supposed to stop an accident or something or keep a... That's magic. Uh, that's magic. Well, what some people do is sanctify their car by putting a graphe in it. They have a graphe in the glove compartment uh, like that's going to be magic or somehow their living room going to get holy because there's a Bible on the coffee table. That's graphe. Now, don't get me wrong. It is the Bible. It is the word of God, but that's not what the Spirit's using. There is the Logos. For example, in St. John 1, in the beginning was the word, the Logos. Now, the Logos goes further than the graphe. The graphe is the book written that has been written. The Logos is the message of the book. It is, it is its message content. This is the Bible when you don't read it, when you do read it. It is the Bible because it is the Bible. Its message is the Logos. So, when you come to church and you hear a sermon preached and you understand what the passage says, you've just experienced the Logos because now you've gotten the message of the graphe. So the content has now been clarified to you and you understand. Now, Logos... is very powerful, but that's not the word in verse 17. He doesn't say the sword of the spirit, which is the graphe of God. He doesn't say the sword of the spirit, which is the uh, logos of God. He says the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema of God. His Greek word is rhema. 
Now, we'll explain how this ties together in a minute. But his Greek word is rhema. Now, rhema means utterance or words spoken or declared. It is the declaration of the logos that you got from the graphe. The graphe is the book. The logos is the message. The rhema is the utterance, the speech, the spokenness of the message. He says the sword that the spirit uses is the rhema of God. Here it is. The graphe, the book, gives you the logos, the message, but it is the rhema that plunges in and draws blood. It is the rhema that the spirit uses. So many of us are not seeing the power of the spirit because we haven't graduated to the rhema. We're either stuck at graphe, others of us, perhaps most of us, we come to understand the logos, the message. We want to understand the sermon. We want to understand the truth. We want to understand its message. We may be inspired by it. We're educated by it, oriented by it. And so we now understand something we did not previously understand from the graphe that now has become logos in our minds and understanding. But when it comes to spiritual warfare, when the enemy is all up in your grill, you need more than graphe and logos, you need rhema. You need the logos from the graphe uttered. Spoken or declared. Why do you want to rhema the Logos? Because you have to understand this for, to, 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 to fully get this. Why do you want to rhema, utter, declare, speak the Logos, the message? Because of the intrinsic nature of the Logos. Turn to Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We'll come back, back to Rhema in a minute, but I want you to understand it because what you are doing the Rhema on is the Logos. To get the Logos, you bring the Graphe. So I go to the Graphe, the writings, to get the message. But I don't get the message to say I enjoy church. I get the message so when I need rhema. In Hebrews chapter 4, he speaks about the logos. And this is what he says, beginning in verse 12. For the word, logos of God, the logos of God, Watch this now. Is living. When you get the message, not when you carry the book, but when you get the message, that is a living message. It is not just information. It is alive. The Logos of God is alive. And it is active. It is not only alive, it has energy behind it. You know, it's got a force field. He says the Logos of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Watch this now. He says the Logos of God is sharper than a sword whose blades on both sides have been sharpened. In other words, it can cut you either way. You can go this way and it'll cut you. You can go that way and it'll cut you because on both sides it's sharp. I know you got to follow me here. He says the Logos of God. Okay, but I, I know what you're thinking. You say, but wait a minute. You just said it a minute ago that the sword of the spirit is the rhema. Yes. The sword of the spirit is the rhema when he's going to use it. 
But I'm trying to tell you what he uses when he uses it. He uses it when it's Rhema. It's alive when it's Logos. So by the time it hits Rhema, if you got Logos, you got a sword with life in it. Because he says the Logos of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and is piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. Now, why do you need to know that the Logos of God can get down to spirit and soul? Because your spirit and soul is your invisible world. That, that's the invisible world. Your visible world is the physical, your body. Your invisible world, the world where you truly live, is made up of soul, your personality, and it's made up of spirit, the God presence in you. He says, this thing is so sharp that it can slice the invisible realm, separating, separating spirit and soul. Now, why does, why does God want to use the Logos, the message, to separate your spirit from your soul? Because your soul gets in the way of the spirit. Your personality, how you are raised, your orientation, your, your thought, your perspective keeps getting in God's way. So God's got to slice you out of the way so his spirit can break through. See, we have so intertwined our souls with God's spirit that we keep getting in God's way. So God wants the Logos to get you out the way. And he wants to get you out the way. And he says the only thing that can do that is the message of God. So when you come and you hear the message, you hear the content of the word, and it dawns on you that what you thought and what God says isn't the same. You just got sliced and diced. When you come and you hear the word of God and you discover that your perspective, what mama taught you, what daddy taught you, disagrees with what God says, and it dawns on you, you had all this stuff mixed up, and you had God's name all up in your soul. When God it had nothing to do with how you were thinking and how you were functioning and how you were operating, you got sliced and diced. He said it is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can divide. It is piercing. It, it is penetrating down to the invisible level of joints and marrow and it is able to discern, judge. It is able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, see, see here's the problem with the word. With the, with the Logos. The problem with the Logos is it not only attacks what you do, it attacks what you think. He says it gets down to what you were thinking. It gets down to the thought and it goes deeper than the thought. It goes to the intent. Not only what you were thinking, but what you were thinking about what you were thinking. Uh, let's put it another way. The word of God's goal, Logos, is to expose. It is to expose. It is God's MRI machine. It is God's x-ray machine. If all you get when you come to church is what you hear in your external ear, all you did was open up graphe. You opened up Grafe and somebody told you something. When the truth hits you, you ran into Logos. You ran into Logos because the message is given. Jesus is called the Logos in John 1 because he was God's messenger. He came to present God to human beings. He was the deliverer of the message. He says that the word of God, the Logos, penetrates with power. When the message is given, when you grab the message and accept it, you now have understanding. You say, oh, that's what that says and that's what that means. Then what happens? He says, 
the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema of God. Now he brings in rhema. Rhema is the word of God uttered or used. Graphe is the writings. It's, it's, it's just been written. Logos is the message of what's been written. Rhema is the use of the message. When you pull out rhema, you just pulled out the spirit because the sword is the sword of the spirit. When you pull out rhema, that is when the word that you have becomes the message that you deliver in short battle conflict when it's all up in your face. You have now given something the spirit uses. If you're satisfied with graphe, just having a Bible in your car, you know, on your kitchen table, in your bookshelf, or under your arm, that's not going to help you in close-up, up-front battle. If you only have logos coming to church, hearing the sermon, even understanding the message, that message is true, that message is alive, that message is active, that message works in the spiritual realm, but in close-up battle, when hell breaks through in your life, the evil day, he says what the Spirit wants you to use now is not just the, the understanding tapes you've been listening to or radio broadcasts you've been listening to. It now has to do with a sword you use a dagger you use, and he calls that the rhema of God, the utterance of God. Okay. In the beginning, God said, said, let there be light. God spoke, and the Bible says, and it was so. In other words, the spoken word had within it the power to do what the spoken word declared would be done. He, God spoke it and what he said happened. And it happened exactly like he spoke it, but watch this, it didn't happen until he spoke it. God didn't just think, world, 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 coming to being, coming to being, uh-uh. He declared it. And when he declared, let there be light, Bam, there was light because there was power in the word used not just God even having the word known God knows it all but he used what he knew the spoken word had power in it to produce what the spoken word called for it was a dagger used. That is, it was, it was what the Spirit, and how, how do we know that the Spirit had something to do with it? Because it says that when, uh, when God was ready to create, the Spirit of God was hovering over, ready to move when it heard the spoken word. The, the, the Spirit of God was just hovering over, just biding his time, saying to the Father, as soon as you talk, I'm ready to act. I'm hanging out. I'm hanging out. As soon as you say something, I'm going to do something, but I'm waiting on you, Father, because I can't do something till you say something. But when you say something, whatever you say, I'm going to do because you will have given me what I need to pull it off. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, what did the devil do? Mess with that word. He said, well, half God said, half God said, that, let's talk about what God said because he knew if he could mess up the use of the word, he would mess up their power and he could now take control because he not heard of your words. In fact, the devil loves to hear you say, well, I think, he loves to hear you say, well, my opinion is. He loves to hear you say, well, my daddy told me. 
He loved to hear you say, this is what my mama taught me. He loves to hear you say, what well, all my friends say. He loves that because he knows there is no power. He knows there is no power in that. He knows that sword is dull on both sides. He knows that ain't going to do anything for, with him. That ain't going to do it. He loves for you to go look at Oprah and find out what Oprah says and, and, and find out what this group says and find out what that group says and find out, that he look at all the news show and find out everything. He loves that because he knows there's no power in that. He ain't scared of that because he knows the spirit is not in it. But when you go rhema, when you go rhema, when you take the logos and use the logos, he's allergic to <laughs> He's allergic to that. He says, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It is the rhema of God. The utterance of the logos that you got from the graphe. When you take the Bible, get the message, and use the message as uttered, the enemy in your face can't handle that. Look at Matthew chapter 4 real quick. Matthew chapter 4. That's the first book of the New Testament. Matthew 4. <laughs> then Jesus, verse 1, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, watch this now. The Spirit of the Lord led Jesus into the wilderness for the express purpose of being tempted by the devil. And the tempter came to him, verse 3, and said to him, if, it's called a first class condition in the Greek, which means since, because Jesus, the devil knows who Jesus is, since you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. Okay, now we read at the end of verse 2, Jesus is hungry. So where does the devil meet Jesus? He meets Jesus at the point of his problem. Jesus is struggling because he's hungry. He's struggling for physical food. He's hungry. So the devil shows up at a specific time to address a specific need, a legitimate need in his life that he is now hungry. So what does he offer? He offers Operation Bread Basket. He offers him a feeding program. He says, look, you're the son of God. You can do whatever you want to do. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? Jesus says, it is written. No, he didn't. Guess what Jesus doesn't do? Get into a long meeting. He says, why don't we have a three-hour meeting to discuss this? Get into a long conversation. He doesn't go get into a long dialogue or diatribe. Uh, he, he doesn't get all that. He says, um, it's written. It's written. Now, watch this. The living word. The Bible calls Jesus the living word. Okay, he's the living word. If the living word needed to use the written word to deal with the enemy of the word, then how much more you and I who have written no word need to use that same word against the enemy of the word? What makes you think you better than Jesus? Jesus wouldn't even go at the devil based on what he thought. And he had perfect thinking. He wouldn't go after the devil based on who, who said what and what. He didn't even say, well, 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 this is my, what my daddy taught me. He said, let me tell you what the graphe says. But when he tells him what the graphe says, he tells him what the graphe says based on logos. Because he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
So guess what? Jesus is in the New Testament, but he reaches back to the Old Testament to a passage that dealt with the situation he was currently facing in the New Testament because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. So he's hungry. The devil says, I've got a feeding program. Jesus goes into his computer. He Googles it. Feeding program, feeding program, feeding program, feeding program. Bing! He hits feeding program in Deuteronomy 8. Well, Israel is crossing the wilderness, and they are hungry, and they need a feeding program. So when he Googled feeding program, it took him back to Deuteronomy 8, and it told him when they were crossing the desert, and they were hungry, that they called on God, and he, ran down, he rained down cornflakes from above called manna. The Hebrew word manna means what is it or if you're urban what it is and it had to do with cornflakes from above. He rained down cornflakes from above. In other words, God met them in their hunger through a supernatural means. The devil was offering to solve the problem through a satanic means. God is offering to solve it his way. The devil was offering to solve it his way. Both were trying to address a legitimate need. The issue is not, is my need legitimate? The issue is, who's giving me the advice as to how to address it? Jesus Christ Googled down feeding program, ran to Deuteronomy 8 and say, devil, let me tell you what God said about this situation. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but man also lives by where it came from. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When he heard what was written, he couldn't handle that anymore. He went to another subject. He then takes him to the top of the temple and says, jump off, because then everybody will know you're Messiah when you hit the ground like Superman, Spider-Man, or Batman. They will see that that jump didn't kill you, and they will all know you are the Son of God. Guess what Jesus says? It is written again. He says, it is written. You shall not, verse 7, put the Lord God to the test. He was saying, Satan was saying, test God. God said, don't test me. He said, Satan, this is what God told me to tell you about you telling me right now to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. Then he, verse 8, he took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the world and their glory. He took him. Please notice, he took him. He took him. Do you know sometimes God will let the devil take you? It took him. He took him. God let the devil take Jesus, and Jesus goes along. The God let the devil take him. He took him. He said, now I give you all this stuff, all this money, all this glory, all this power, all this fame. I'm going to give all this stuff to you if you do really what I was after all the time. Get on a knee and worship me. If you will just recognize me as Lord of your life, I'm going to give you the whole world. I'm going to give you the whole world, Jesus. Jesus said after this, after he took him, Jesus said, verse 10, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and uh, serve him only. Satan said, worship me. Jesus Googled worship. Bing, okay? You shall worship the Lord your God. But he didn't just study the Bible and know what it said. He opened up his mouth and said what it said. He told the devil, devil, let me tell you what God just said about what you're telling me. And when he told the devil this, the Bible says that the devil, verse 11, left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. The devil left him. Oh, oh, I hope you get this. God likes baseball. Three strikes you out. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. The devil couldn't handle more than three strikes and the devil was gone. You say, why won't the devil leave me alone? Because he know you ain't going to ever say it is written. He knows you're never going to bring that up. <laughs> he knows you're going to start talking about my neighbor, my family, my friends, my, my thinking, my TV, my reading, my education. He knows you're never going to go and Google anything about what is written. Or you, if you do, you're never going to use it. So he doesn't have to fear you. He can hang out with you all day. Because he knows that you will not use the one tool that the Spirit does use to give you victory in the spiritual realm. In other words, you read the graphe so you can understand the locust so you can use the rhema. You read the graphe so you can understand the locust uh, logos so you can use the rhema. 
it is to be used not only to be read, not only to be understood, it is to be used. And guess who you're supposed to use it on? You're supposed to use it on the enemy or any of his reps. Now you'll see the power of the word. Now you'll see the power of the word. Because when that word gets pushed down into the spiritual realm, when it gets driven down into the spiritual realm and used in that realm, it is transformed.